This is Stacy Krim interviewing with David Gwynn. We are interviewing for the Pride of the Community Project. Today is April 20th, 2021. Thank you for joining us today. Can you oh, please thank you. tell us your name and uh, the pronouns you would like to use for the interview? Sure. Uh, my name is Austin Horn, and I use he, him pronouns. Okay. Um, thank you for talking to us today, Austin. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited about this project. So where are you from originally? I'm from Moxville, which is like an hour west of here. Um, it's in Davie County. Um, I've spent most of my life in North Carolina, but I was born in Jackson, Mississippi. My parents moved around a lot when I was young. Um, but I grew up here and then I returned here um, to start college. Well, I returned here to take a break from college and then I ended up starting college while I was doing that. Um, and uh, so you were attending your, your schools prior to UNCG mm -hmm. in uh, Ox, Oxford, Oxville? No, I was in um, Florida. Florida. Yeah, I went to um, Pasco Hernando State University. Okay. Um, State College, actually. Yeah, it's not a university. Okay. Um, and for your, like, uh, high school and so forth, what was the climate like in your high school for LGBTQ people? It was weird. Um... There were openly gay men. I don't think I knew of any openly queer in any way, women or any um, non-binary people. Um, I think in high school, I didn't really know. I kind of had an idea. Um, and I liked the crowd of people who were um, supportive of gay rights and wanted um, gay marriage to become legal. I don't remember what... I think I, I might have been in high school when that was happening. Okay. Do you know what the year was? Was that when that passed? 15. 15. Okay, yeah, that was the year that I graduated high school. Okay. So yeah, that was kind of a big issue. Um, while I was in high school, I would say the climate was not very friendly. Um, like I said, there were out people, but they were wealthy. They were socially well positioned. Um, there wasn't anybody who was able to come out who wasn't one of those two things. Mm -hmm. And where was your high school located? It was in Davie County. I went to Davie High. Yeah, it's the only uh, high school in the county, so it has like a ton of students for such a small area. Mm -hmm. And um, so the comfort level was not good for, for students nope. there at that time. Okay. Yeah. And you attended, uh, when you moved, you went to Florida for your first years of college. Mm -hmm. And how was the climate? I was thinking about this the other day. The climate was was interesting. I think while I was in Florida, um, so right after I graduated, we moved to Florida, which is where my family is pretty much based. Um, and I went to my first year of college there. Um, and the climate was weird. Uh, I was really involved in the like gaming club there. It was pretty general. I think it was literally called like the game and anime club, but it was like it was all over the place. It had a lot of individual groups within it, um, and within that group, I don't think there were any openly queer people. Um, I was always kind of excluded a little bit because of the way that I presented. Um, at the time, I was like kind of just starting to figure out why that was. Um, but I don't remember having any really explicit conversations about people being, um, homophobic or in any way exclusive. It just wasn't something that happened. So you would have been in Florida when North Carolina was going through HB2 and yes. anti-trans legislation. Mm -hmm. Do you remember seeing news coverage and what you thought of it at that time? Yeah, that was kind of interesting for me because, um like living my entire life in the South and being surrounded by, you know, 99% um, straight and cis people, I didn't really know anything about trans people. Um, so I remember uh, Caitlyn Jenner transitioned publicly and that was a big thing because I, I didn't really, I had never really heard of a trans identity before that point. Um, and then HB2 was happening and I remember it not really affecting me. Um, I wasn't politically active at the time. I wasn't, I didn't realize how much of an influence this community would have on me 
at the time, so it wasn't something I paid a whole lot of attention to. It, it became a much bigger part of my life when I moved back, and then eventually when I got my current job as a gender and sexuality educator here, that it became something I was much more aware of. Mm -hmm. um, so what, when did you move back to North Carolina? So that just hit me in the glasses. Um, <laughs> I, uh, let me see, I graduated in 2015. In fall of 2015, I started my first year at uh, PHSC, and then after after that first year was over, um, I was able to move back here. So I want to say it was probably late May, early June of of 2016. Okay, so you were you were coming back right in the heyday of, of HP two. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, did you immediately start attending UNCG when you came back? No, I, um, I did very little, um, in terms of, like, professional experience for two years. You know, I worked some on and off jobs, I worked at coffee shops, um, when I was at PHSC, I really was like, I don't know what I'm doing here, and I don't know what I'm majoring in, and I don't know why I'm even going to school, and I hate Florida, so... I came to North Carolina, um, and I am financially privileged enough that my parents were able to support me, um, and I had a lot of downtime. Um, I had a lot of time to kind of, like, try to figure out who I am, I guess. That's very um, cliche, but that's, the, that's kind of the reality of what I did. And uh, at what point did you decide to attend UNCG? I decided I was kind of um, flip-flopping, was that 2018? Yeah, I think I started here August 2018. And um, kind of late 2017, early 2018, I was, I knew that I wanted to go back to school. Um, and my partner, uh, who I'm still with, um, lived in Greensboro and I would meet up with her a lot. Um, so I was like, I want to go to Greensboro, but before that, I was like, where do I want to go? I really wanted to go to App because I had some uh, prior experience with App, but once I knew that like I had a community in Greensboro, I had a couple friends, my partner obviously lived here, um, and I knew the one of the first things I learned about UNC Greensboro was what the LGBTQ plus community here was like, and I heard that it was called UNC Gay, um, so that was one of the big things that drew me to it. So it was kind of between uh, the period in Florida and then coming back to Greensboro that you began to think about your identities? Yeah, there was a little bit when I was in my first year of college in Florida. Um, and then I had a friend who I'm going to give a fake name because some incriminating stuff might come up. Um, we'll call them Steve. Steve um, really helped me figure out who I was um, once I started dating Kayla, who's the name of my partner. Um, I realized, like, I'm definitely not straight, and I'm not sure if I'm cis. Um, and Steve really helped me figure that out. Um, and they were a student at UNCG at the time. So I started to connect with that. So yeah, I kind of figured out in the, in the interim, um, but a lot of my, my exploration was in that year, uh, like the year leading up to me starting school here. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that exploration? Yeah, um, it was really interesting. So during like the first couple of months that we were dating, um, I came out to Kayla um, and she was very supportive and, and open with it. Um, at, at the time I came out to her I think as bi and non-binary was what I called myself at the time. Um, that has switched up a little bit, but I'm generally in the same space now. Um, but yeah, that experience was interesting. Steve was like the only, um, well, Kayla is also queer, but Steve is the only um, non-cis person I really was friends with at the time. And they were really into the party scene here around UNCG, so I, I went to a couple parties with them. Um, the very first party I ever went to, um, I, I was 19 or 20, um, I just decided 
to go not dressed as a woman, but just very feminine. Um, before I had my hair like this, my hair was like this long. Um, so at the time I had super long hair um, and I was in a, a long flowing skirt um, and I decided to dress in a really feminine style for the first like adult or college party that I ever went to. And I kind of can't believe I did that looking back on it because I wasn't, I wasn't a partier, I wasn't a drinker. I had like no prior experience at the time. Um, and I just did that and it was terrifying, but also, it was also like kind of liberating. Um, I haven't done that a lot since my, uh, how I went to present kind of like fluctuates, um, in the middle and sort of an androgynous space. Um, but that was an experience that, that really helped me figure out where I was and, and it felt freeing. And was the party at someone's house? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it was a house party. It was at, um... There are, so nowadays, I don't, I don't know what the history is like. Y'all will definitely know that better than I do. Um, but now I know that there's a lot of houses that each have different names um, that are associated with different fraternities or organizations or whatever. I don't know the name of this house. It's a house that's on the corner of um, where the College Hill Bar is and where I think it's like firehouse grocery um there's a house right there and that, that's where the party was at it's right by the province um i'm sure it, it has a name because it was a big party house that steve told me a lot about what were uh the reactions of people at the party they were good um i remember uh this was i grew up um really bullied pretty heavily and I, I didn't really have uh, many romantic relationships so I, I never thought of myself as somebody who was attractive um, but at that at that party there was a guy who I, I assume was a gay guy I have no idea what his sexuality was I was drunk um, but there was a guy there who was kind of like making eyes at me and flirting a little bit of course I was with Kayla so that wasn't going to go anywhere but it, like the the confidence boost from that was crazy because that would had never happened to me before um, I remember there was a guy there actually who I grew up with, who I went to elementary school with and middle and high. Um, and he was always a great guy. He was always popular, but he wasn't among the groups that, that caused me so much trouble. Um, so I was really scared to see him there, even though he was a nice guy. Um, I don't, I don't think he recognized me, um, and definitely didn't have a bad reaction or anything. So uh, generally reactions were like neutral to positive. And um, how did your family react? So yeah, my um, my family still doesn't know. Um, I work in this space, and I write very openly. I'm, I'm also the the news editor at the Carolinian here right now, and I write very openly. Um, I've never written for the paper and been like, I'm queer, and like that's not something that <laughs> a reporter is gonna do. Um, but, you know, I, I write in this space a lot, um, but they don't really read that. They don't, they don't know that I'm out. They don't, um, follow my work really. Um, so yeah, I, I have the privilege of, since I'm attracted to all genders, uh, I'm dating somebody who identifies as a cis woman right now and, um, I'll probably marry this person I intend to and, um. So I have the privilege of being able to kind of sneak under the radar of my family um, for as however long that feels comfortable. So I have to ask, this is a, an interview where you're, you're giving your name and telling your story. Of course. And they could conceivably Google your name yes. and find this. So is this a subtle way of coming out? I don't know. Um, a, a big part of the reason that I haven't come out is because I'm still financially tied to my family. And that's the primary thing that I fear. Um, outside of that, if they found this, um, it would be okay. This isn't intended as a, as a way to come out, but I'm kind of like, if they, if they figured out, it would be okay. I just don't see how it's their business really for the most part, um, outside of the way that I present. And even then, like, even if I was out, I don't think I would be comfortable presenting the way that I do here in front of them. Um, 
so it's not intended that way, but if it happens, it, it happens, and I'm comfortable with that reality. Um, so uh, you, you learned we are UNC gay, mm -hmm. and that was a major choice in your decision to attend this school. Mm -hmm. um, what did, uh, did you know what you wanted to major in when you started attending? I thought I did. Um, I wanted to major, I started as a English secondary education major, I think is what it's called. I wanted to be a high school English teacher. Um, and I became a lot more politically aware in, in the time that I was here. And I always knew like, um, that we don't treat our teachers well in this country. Um, but I, I don't think I understood the extent of, um, schooling that teachers have to go through. And I don't think I understood just the, the imbalance between the job and, and the, the work. Um, so it, it became something that I, I didn't think I wanted to do anymore sadly, and then I became an English major. Um, so yeah, I thought I did. It changed. Are there any um, professors that were particularly influential to you? Hmm, for sure, definitely. Um, specifically college professors, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Dr. Adams, Dr. Heather Adams, has been a big influence. Um, I don't think... Of course, how would I know a lot of the time? But I, I don't think I've had any professors who are in the LGBTQ plus community. So they haven't really had an effect on me in this realm. But in terms of my professional development, for sure, Dr. Adams has had a huge influence on me. Um, Dr. Amy Vines, who teaches a like Lord of the Rings study class, at a Tolkien class, um, had a big influence on me because it, it kind of made me feel like I can... Um, there's there's room for us to to study the things that I'm interested in, in in academia rather than only being very historical and about the English canon. Um, any professors outside of English? Hmm. All my professor, almost all of my professor uh, experiences have have been great. Um, I don't think there's been anybody outside of the English department who has really like changed my worldview. Um, I've learned a ton, but but nothing shocking. I did actually at um, PHSC. I don't remember his name. I had I had one like philosophy professor who in my first semester was really influential. But I I think a big part of that was just that I was entering the college experience for the first time and um, learning what this is all about and what it even looks like was eye opening. And were you a commuter or did you stay on campus? Um, here? Mm -hmm. A little of both. <laughs> I'm a commuter now. Um, when I started here, I lived in the province and you can walk from there. So I guess I was technically a commuter, but I walked all my classes. It felt like I lived on campus mm -hmm. um, for the first couple before COVID. Um, I lived at the province and then I lived at I don't remember the name of the other one. There's another community near campus that I lived at that I that I walked from. Um, so I felt like I've lived on campus. I've been for uh, professional purposes as a commuter. And um, where do you go to socialize? No, I spilled water. That's all right. <laughs> um, so my socialization since I've come here happens a lot within um, SF3, which is the Science Fiction Fantasy Federation. Uh, they have a long and crazy name, so everybody calls them SF3. Uh, SF Cube. SF That's better, even though it's kind of dorkier. <laughs> I think that was the point. <laughs> yeah, I like that it embraces it. We should go back. Um, yeah, SF3 um, is where I do most of my, my socialization. I've played... Dungeons and Dragons for like almost 10 years or something like that. So I'm, I'm super into that and I'm, I'm really into um, card games. There's a, a card game called Magic the Gathering that I, that I play a lot. Um, so most of my socialization happens within that club. There's also some, there's like uh, Steve's group, although we don't, they and I aren't friends anymore. Um, but that used to be a thing, but nowadays it's like, all SF3 because COVID has kind of like broken a lot of the, the minor connections that I had, sadly. Um, well, since you brought it up, let's talk a bit about COVID and its impact at your time in college. Yeah. So what year were you when COVID started? 
Um, I was a junior. Yeah, because it was at the beginning of, of 20, 2020. Um, because I'm a transfer student, my years are kind of weird. They didn't take all of my credits, most of them. So I'm like sort of flip-flopped, but I think I was technically a junior. And did you do all online classes? Um, during the first semester, I don't think I did. I think I had one in person. Because now we're in the, yeah, I had, I had one, I had a French class in person um, that met twice a week, but everything else online. And since you had already had college experience in the normal, normal world, we'll call it, um, can you compare the differences between um, your life before and after COVID started as a UNCG student? Oh, I can try. Um, I don't think I can encapsulate like the, how crazy that has been. Um, I mean, after everything is different, you know, you don't walk to class. Um, you don't like a lot of people couldn't live on campus, you know, that the, the dorms were evacuated um, for a while. The atmosphere is completely different. Socialization is hard because um, if you you can't you things are getting a little different now. Um, it's. April 20th and, and yesterday, I think every adult over 16, and I guess that's every adult, every adult in the US became eligible. Um, so things are changing now, but like you just can't do any socialization, you know? Um, so you, you have to do everything online and just spending so many hours in front of a screen has been exhausting over the past year. Um, the way that I do my job has been has been totally different. I've been so lucky that I've been able to keep my job here, um, but I don't get to do most of the things that I that I used to love doing. Um, it's more like a way for the school to support a student at this point, um, or at least it was. But yeah, I mean, everything changed. I feel like we could talk the entire interview about like all of the individual uh, changes that have happened and how everyone's mindset has changed. And I think. Um, I think every person who, I, everybody who has lived through this pandemic is going to be changed forever. Um, and I think in some ways that can be said extra for, for college students because it's such a formative time for us. And for a lot of them, it's like just this tragedy on a scale we haven't had in a long time. And um, were you able to develop networks in the LGBTQ community here before the pandemic started? A little bit. Um, SF3 has a lot of overlap, and especially Dungeons & Dragons has a huge overlap um, within the LGBTQ plus community. So um, somewhat, my really close circle of friends, um, I believe is mostly straight people. Um, a lot of people my age don't really date, so... Um, I don't ask them all if they're straight, like we were talking about earlier. Um, but I'm definitely the most openly out person that I, that in that close group. I have some friends and, and connections, but um, they've all been like, especially since since COVID, they've all been like we message sometimes, and we don't really have any planned activities together. But we, we know of each other, and um, we we talk a little bit. And. Um... Are you part of any LGBTQ organization on campus or in the community? Um, I work in the, the Office of Intercultural Engagement, if that counts. Um, I, at one point, was a member of No Labels, but I, I stopped doing that. Um, I had a really difficult, I, it's gotten better um, as I've grown as a queer person, but um, especially in my first semesters here, I had a really hard time socializing and figuring out what my place was because I, I felt like I was never gay enough, I guess, um, to be in a lot of queer organizations. And I didn't feel like I was straight enough to be in a lot of <laughs> um, just general organizations. So um, sometimes I felt myself like caught in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. Well, can we talk a little bit about that and mm -hmm. the environment at UNCG for LGBT? what they experience, but also what is experienced within that community. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit about that? Um, 
so to clarify what the what the what our community experiences yes. um and as, how your experience has been within the community yeah what, what we experience as far as like the how the broader community of uncg treats us yes okay um yeah i i, I feel like it's as far as the public stuff that I see, it's fine. Um, I am happy to be the first line for a lot of the, the weirdness a lot of the times because I teach um, the safe zone curriculum. So usually we field some of the strangest questions. Um, like, you know, what does, what genitals does this trans identity have? You know, are pedophiles in the LGBTQ plus community? Just, just very strange things i don't know how these things get out there um i've i've never seen that um conflict come to a head in person between you know two members of different communities that's it's normally been when i'm in an educator role that that sort of thing happens um so i think it's generally good there is a i hesitate to say clickiness but there's you know there's a little bit of um there's like fields, right? There's a, there's always a little bit of space um, between the people who identify in, in our community and the people who don't. There, there's often kind of like social groups that are very similar aside from the part that most of the people in this group are straight and most of the people in this group are in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so I, I, I don't see it clash openly, like I've seen at some other universities and at some, you know, um, lower levels of learning, but it's not always like, it's not perfectly intermingled in the way that we would like. And you identify, you said, as non-binary mm -hmm. and uh, bisexual. Mm -hmm. um, and how, with those identities, do you find you fit within the LGBTQ? I don't know because because <laughs> um, I think of myself as a non-binary person, but I have the privilege that I uh, pass as cis like 99% of the time. You know, I'm I'm still um, experimenting and seeing like how comfortable I am with with varying aspects of my presentation. I've experimented a lot with makeup. Um, generally, if I try to leave the house in that sort of way, I will kind of freak out. <laughs> uh, it's not something I've gotten comfortable enough doing yet. Um, as a as a bi man, I feel especially like I'm in a strange place. Um, this is just my experience, but I, I feel like there's a lot of inclusion for um, bi women, and I, I don't always see the same thing for people like me, um, especially because I'm, I'm in a heterosexual relationship, um, even though it's between two queer people. Um, and I, I just like, I get a lot of privilege from that. You know, I don't have to worry about, there's other things I have to worry about, but I, I don't have to worry about um, going to the supermarket with my boyfriend and, and getting catcalled or getting harassed or anything. So sometimes that, um, puts me outside of the community a little bit because my experiences just in going about day-to-day -day activities don't always line up with theirs. Um, yeah, a lot of this is stuff that is internal for me. You know, I, I've, been, I've been taught varying things about queer people and, you know, those come from sources that aren't always accurate. You know, they're things we teach, teach to children. Um, so I have a lot of fears about my place in the, in the queer community. I don't know that they're all, uh, accurate. I haven't seen people, you know, nobody has run up to me trying, me trying to go to pride. Nobody has like stopped me and be like, you're not gay enough. Um, but it's like, it's something that I, that I fear. Yeah, um, it was a little over two years ago now, uh, I think January or February of 2019, um, Elliot Kimball, who y'all have also interviewed, 
um, started this program called Gender and Sexuality Educators, where he was looking for queer identifying students who wanted to um, work as student educators with the Office of Intercultural Engagement and be trained as fac facilitators for the Safe Zone and Trans Zone programs. Um, and the idea was that we would also come in and, and bring fresh ideas. You know, we would be direct links into the community um, and sort of the the connective tissue between administration and students. Um, so I applied for that and was very lucky to be uh, one of four people to get that job. Um, and since then we were we were trained. The, the primary thing that we do is present these Safe Zone presentations. Um, and it's really exciting and fun. I've, I've gotten to work with a lot of students. Um, I've gotten to work with a lot of faculty. Those are often the weirder meetings. Um, <laughs> I've, you know, um, it's been an honor to, to work with people from like freshman level to like deans. It's, uh, it's strange to teach the same thing across the board, but it also helps me feel better because like everybody's getting the same thing. You know, we all, this is something we all understand um, and we can all agree on and work with. Generally speaking, what are some of the differences you see when you're educating students versus faculty and staff? Mm. Students are generally already familiar um, with the concept of pronouns. Um, sometimes, especially older faculty, are uh, so far away from the, the public school system where they first learned about pronouns that they forget. You know, it's just such it's so it's such ingrained knowledge that um, like I'll I'll start every safe zone with like, hi, my name is Austin Horn. I'm a student here at UNCG and I'm a gender and sexuality educator. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And um, oftentimes faculty members will, will raise their hand and ask what that means. And students are always like ready to go, totally understand it. Um, normally we have to do a lot more education around the LGBTQ alphabet. So, you know, like what each acronym means and why the plus is there and how we use the word queer, how it's been redefined. Um, a lot of that basic education often has to happen more with faculty than with students. Um, of course, these are generalities and, and every student and every faculty member is different, but that's, that's been my experience. Um, Oftentimes, students are not as uh, engaged as faculty members. This has been the, the thing that I've been most excited about with faculty members is that um, they're usually like so excited to learn. You know, they are often really busy and they have two, they have like two hours with me or something. Um, one time I was given three hours to teach Safe Zone 1, Safe Zone 2, and Trans Zone, which are each three hour programs. So I had to condense nine hours of material into three hours. Um, so the faculty work with me and are like super attentive and are really interested in asking questions because, um, you know, most of them didn't grow up in the same world that, that our students are growing up in now where a lot of this they're, they're learning about through their peers or through themselves or through the internet. Um, so yeah, oftentimes they're a lot more attentive where sometimes students are like are made to be in the presentations and they aren't really uh, there to be, you know, super chatty with me. So it sounds like um, the students in some ways are just the generation they grew up in, they're better prepared. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just through the internet, like eh, most people have access to this just like crazy web of knowledge. So anybody who is interested can learn. Um, and there is a ton of information out there that is spotty, <laughs> I would say, or incomplete or um, just wrong, but they're still thinking about it and they're still learning. And so like 95% of students that I work with have the basic understanding of like, here, here are the core identities and here are what pronouns are. Take me from there. I think that that one 
three hour session is probably the most memorable thing. Um, because it just kind of showed the, the trust that the school had with me. You know, when I did that, I was like 21 or 22, you know, I'd given the presentation, I'd given the presentation before and I, I, I knew everything, but it's like, you know, the, the reason they did it was they were bringing in a new dean for the, the music building, the music department, I guess. Um, and they wanted him and the whole, a, a, a big portion of the music department to go through this class together. Um, and I was like, why are y'all having me do this? We need, you know, Elliot should be in here doing this. I'm not important enough to talk to these people. Um, so not so much, even, even though the one-on-one -on -one conversations we had were great, it was more just that um, Elliot and the office had the confidence to push me forward and be like, yeah, you can, you can do that. Um, that has really changed how I, how I think about myself and how I feel about my public speaking skills, how I feel about my capabilities. Um, that's something that's really coming to the head for me right now as I'm like, I'm about to graduate and I'm thinking about jobs and um, what I feel ready for, I think is entirely different than what I might have felt ready for if I hadn't been able to have this job. And it sounds like you're still um, thinking about your identities mm -hmm. and figuring out who you are. Um, and this job as a, a safe sim trainer is very much putting you in the spotlight mm -hmm. um, where people are going to be asking you potentially personal questions and assume you are the master of all knowledge on sex and gender. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a bit about your experience personally going in because it's putting you in a very vulnerable position? It, it can. Um, I have an advantage that, that not all of my colleagues have in that I'm quite tall and um, I'm a man and I have kind of this deep voice. Um, so I've found that people listen to me a lot more readily than they listen to my colleagues. Like I... I um, have another person who's in this job or their name is Lacey um and I don't know how tall Lacey is but Lacey is short compared to me and has a high kind of feminine voice um and one time Lacey and I did a presentation together and I remember Lacey was trying to quiet the class down because they were kind of like gossiping and not really paying attention to us and I was like hey you know, and they like nothing, you know, and that, that was just such a, like going underwater, you know, it, it so easily marked where my privilege is. Um, so that was kind of crazy. It does put me in a vulnerable position sometimes, but generally, um, people kind of respect that. And, um, like, like I was talking about with that confidence earlier, you know, when I'm, in front of a group of people and I've, I've kind of been like handed this uh, UNCG baton. I'm like, I'm here to teach y'all. Um, it, I'm a little bit of a different person and I feel pretty confident um, talking about who I am, especially because I often don't see these people ever again. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't often feel vulnerable in that. I remember there was, <laughs> there was one time, um, that a group of students were very active and interested in talking to me. Um, but then they really wanted to start talking about the intersections of race and gender and sexuality, which I'm happy to talk about, but it's not something that I have a lot of personal experience with as a white man. Um, and uh, they started like throwing away or throwing around the n-word and like asking me questions about it and i was like i don't this is not a question <laughs> for me y'all are asking the wrong person um but but generally my experience has been that people re people respect where my boundaries are um and they respect that like i'm i'm just another student and i you know i I've, I've been taught on this stuff but i don't know everything because you do work in the Office of Intercultural Affairs and you're a senior, do you ever have any incoming freshmen or younger uh, students uh, who look up to you as a mentor? Ooh, you took a turn with the end of that question that I didn't expect. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's weird to think of anyone looking up to me as a mentor, you know. Uh, 
I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I did have in the summer of 2020. No, that's wrong. In the summer of 2019, um, I got to work in the office and I also got to run. I don't, I don't know what the program is called, but there's this thing that we do where we invite incoming freshmen into the, um, the big gym that they built on there. I don't, I don't remember what it's called. Um, but they invite a ton of freshmen out to the gym and they have a bunch of clubs and offices and different departments show up there with a person to um, talk about that. And it's like they, they just walk through all these booths, right, and go wherever they want. Um, and that has been one of my, that was one of my favorite experiences because I got to um, talk to a lot of incoming freshmen about my job and like, you know, here's, here's a, a position that the school has explicitly made for people like you and I. Um, and that's exciting. It, it feels good to, to see people get excited about what I'm doing um, and to see them get excited about the community that they're about to enter into. So th that's been, that was probably my biggest experience with freshmen and younger students, but I can't think of anyone in this community who I, who I think thinks of me as a mentor. What question did you think I was going to ask? Oh, um, you were talking, I didn't know, I didn't like have, I, I wasn't like, oh, I know where this is going, but it just, the idea of someone thinking of me as a mentor kind of uh, shook me to where I was like, why would you ask that? <laughs> Obviously, I'm not a mentor to anyone. Look at me. I know you're teaching Safe Zone programming. <laughs> I know I'm teaching Safe Zone programming. It's just, there's a huge difference between like, um, you know, how we think of ourselves and, and like the like professional roles that we hold, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, uh, this is something I've been bumping up a lot against a lot recently is like writing resumes and cover letters. And I'm like, I am this thing and this thing, and I have these skills and in my head, I'm like, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. What am I doing? <laughs> um, but you know, you have to put on this like facade, you have to fake it until you make it sort of thing. Um, so that's why the, the question through me is I was like, Oh, somebody think of me as a mentor. I, I hope not. <laughs> so in addition to the say so program, you also work for the Carolinium, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I assume this ties into your interest in, in major in, majoring in English. Mm -hmm. uh, how have you enjoyed being a reporter for the Carolinium? Oh, it's been so fun. Um, even though there, there's been like some Carolinian drama in the past year that is beyond the scope of this interview. Um, and just some, some problems that, some logistical problems that we've had to field in, in the COVID pandemic. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been really great. I, um, especially since becoming the news editor, I have really been able to like point our reporting in, in a specific way to try and, and reflect the, the nature of our school's community in a way that I don't think was being reflect, reflected before. Um, my fellow reporters do, do a great job, but I, I, as far as I know, I don't know many openly queer people who work for us. Um, so I, it's been really awesome to be like, you know, I'm a part of this community and I'm in a leadership position, so I can, I can do something about this. You know, I can, um, I can highlight projects like Pride of the Community and I can talk about Pride Month and um, I'm probably going to write something about drag bingo that's coming up this Thursday. Um, yeah, that's been really exciting. So thinking, this is a little bit of a complex question, thinking okay. in terms of as being an editor of a newspaper, mm -hmm. um, and it's a heteronormative newspaper for the most part, it sounds like, mm -hmm. does queering the newspaper, so to speak, go beyond just having stories to the actual perspective of the reports? Hmm. It definitely, it definitely does. It's hard for me to, um, I'm in a weird position where I'm, I finally was able to get into an editor position, but I'm, I'm graduating in the summer. So I, I'm only able to inhabit that role for one semester. Um, but I think it certainly does. I am at, if I had gotten to do more hiring, I think that, I think there's definitely a role for it in the hiring process. Um, I don't think it has as much of an impact as it might on other newspapers because all of our reporters pick their own stories. 
um, and, and choose what they're going to go after. So it's like, I don't go to my writers and go like, here are all these things to, to do, you know? So it, it's not um, filtered through my lens that heavily. You know, the, the main thing that I have control on is um, the stories that, that I do. And of course, those are featured a little bit extra because I'm the, the news editor. Um, so I think it does. I don't think I've been able to delve into those things as much as I would like to because I'm I'm only inhabiting the role for, you know, like two months or something. Uh, and you are an English major. Mm -hmm. You have this experience both as a reporter and editing, but you also have this safe zone training mm -hmm. experience. Do you see yourself potentially uh, going more into sex and gender studies and potentially other educational trainings of that versus um, writing or combining them both? Yeah, I think there's a lot of space to combine them both. That's one of the things that I love the most about writing is that like it is um, sort of a mixer. Like you can you can add your writing skill to anything, and it just gets a little better. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to go into that. I, I don't I don't know how. <laughs> That's one of the things I haven't been trained on. Is I don't know. Um, this experience has been wonderful, and it's had a lot of personal development. I don't know how to translate that personal development into a job or into wealth or, you know, whatever um, currency you want to use. Um, so I would love to. I'm, I'm kind of at the crossroads of, like, how to, how to do that. Um, I was a uh, women and gender studies minor for a little bit. I transitioned to rhetoric and public advocacy because it ended up being that if I wanted to have that minor, I would have to uh, postpone my graduation. Um, so I went for something that I was pretty closely passionate about. Um, but yeah, I would love to work on, in the space. And inevitably, like when I'm right now, when I'm pitching myself to jobs, a big part of what I bring is that I bring a queer perspective and I, I um, bring the knowledge of somebody who's worked as an educator in this space. So I'm like, hello, dear company. Um, I, you know, I know how to, how, how to not make you trending on Twitter for posting something bigoted, hire me. <laughs> so, um, that's a skill I get and I'd love to work in the area. I don't know how to get there. Um, so you'll be graduating in May, is that correct? In August. In August. Um, students, we have a lot of students who look at these interviews, they're mm -hmm. incorporated into classes and there will be students many years down the line from now uh, who will be looking at this interview. Is there any message you'd like to leave for uh, future LGBTQ students at UNCG? Oh my goodness. That's so much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you could just start with get off my lawn. <laughs> get off my lawn, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Leave me alone. Um. <laughs> <sighs> That's so difficult. I don't know. Appreciate yourself. Um, treat yourself the way that you want to treat other people, I think. Um, I think oftentimes people in the queer community, uh, not all of us, but a lot of us know a lot about our history, right? And we know how um, we've been hurt and we know how we continue to hurt. So we can sometimes look for that in, in other people and, and try to help, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, but consider it in yourself, too. You know, how just, I mean, how being involved in a, a history class, for instance, is different for somebody in our community than it is for other people. Um, how seeing these acts of prejudice and violence is, is different for us, how it affects us. Um, so give yourself space and, and time and comfort um, like you would another person is, I guess, a piece of advice. You know, I, I, I just hope that we can all be kind to ourselves. I guess the point that I was trying to build to there was is that um, sometimes in queer communities I see the mother figure. It's kind of a, a trope. Um, and... 
that's great and I'm, I'm glad that you're supporting your community but but make sure that you're not taking too much from yourself for that that's great and is there anything you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered in the interview Ooh, that we haven't covered I don't know, the, the, the party scene around UNC Greensboro is really interesting. I don't have the hugest experience with it, but it's really interesting. And I would suggest that like, um, if there hadn't been a pandemic in my uh, junior, senior year, you know, that that's something that I would have tried to do a lot more is, is socialize and build my social network. Um, but kind of paradoxically, like being in a pandemic has made me value that and want to do that a lot more. So, have you ever had the opportunity to visit like a gay bar? Yes. Um, it's not been something where like I've never gone to a gay bar and had a great time, uh, really. I don't remember the name of it. Steve took me to, um, it's hard, I, I have no idea where it was because at the time that I went to it, it was like the second time I'd been to Greensboro or something. Uh, it wasn't chemistry. It was another one. Q Lounge. Q Lounge. That was it. Um, yeah, we went to Q Lounge, and that was really interesting. And um, I had a fun time there. But like, I am um, pretty introverted, and somebody who uh, has a hard time dancing sober. Um, and I wasn't old enough to drink, uh, so it's, I haven't had as much experience with them as I would like to have. What other party scenes do you think students should check out in the area? Oh, goodness. Whenever they watch this video, I'll have no idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, mostly, like, get in touch with, with bands and musicians. I feel like that's the way that I find out most of the time is, like, a, a local band will be like, we're playing this house show. And then I go there, and it's, like, a dinky little, like, two bedroom squat house with like 250 people there. It's crazy. Um, I, I think going to those parties really like changed part of the way that I started to see myself because I, I would see, um, and not everybody has to be this way, but I would see some of the queer people at these parties and they were always like the life of the party. They were, they were always the most charismatic person in the room and they would, um, command attention and like sometimes be like moving art pieces you know with the way that they dressed and presented themselves or the way that they danced or even the way that they talked um and and that gave me some confidence because even though you know i'm uh that's not something that i always, I always want to do it gave me the confidence to be like you know i'm i'm part of this like strong heritage in a way um and it's okay for me to be out and it's okay for me to like take up space. It's okay for me to exist. Um, do you ever think you'll end up being one of those uh, people who's like moving art? <laughs> them? I love the way you describe that. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I hope so. I mean, I'm like, I, I, I think everybody is like moving toward their, that uh, product in one way or another. Um, in the way that the, the, the people I'm describing were in this very like um, type A personality, charismatic, like fill the room with your energy sort of person. I don't think so. Um, but I don't know, maybe at, in a certain time and place I will be, you know, every, everybody's um, personality changes a little bit to fit the area they're in. I wouldn't be against it. I just, <laughs> I don't know if I see it for myself. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, I don't think so. David, did you have any questions? Um, I think you pretty much covered everything. All right. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Yeah, I thank both of you. Thank you. I had a good time. Thank you.